of all, now I have no disclosures. I have to time myself. Okay. Um, you all stand up and make me uh, stop talking. Uh, <laughs> but I'd like to disclose that um, what I'm presenting here, the work on the telecord and also the uh, clinical um, uh, challenges, is also supported by great collaboration in a great team here at Rhode Island um, and uh, supported by many colleagues. But I'd like to really um, uh, uh, say that two medical students uh, that I want to stand up uh, are helping a great deal with this project, uh, Andrew Powers and Sarah Hayes, uh, and also... <laughs> and I'm really grateful, um, they, um, and it's great to see how um, uh, you can build uh, trust in this in the uh, uh, younger folks. Um, so, let me start with a moment of fame. Tonight in Health Check, it's a debilitating disorder that's poorly understood and hard to diagnose. It's called tethered cord syndrome. As Barbara Moore Silva shows us, getting a correct diagnosis and treatment can make a huge difference. It's new at 5.30. Hi. 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 It's been a good last year or so for a 13-year-old Lucky Ashosier of Braintree, Massachusetts. But before that? Well, I was missing a lot of school. After a long journey, Lucky had surgery here at Hasbro Children's Hospital. Diagnosed with a connective tissue disorder years ago, she and her family started noticing symptoms that didn't quite add up. She had migraines a lot. She got tired easily. We used to always have a wheelchair in the back of the car. Then Lucky's mom, Deirdre, heard about tethered cord syndrome, a disorder in which the spinal cord is stuck to a structure within the spine. They said, oh, she, she doesn't have an abnormal gait, so it's not tethered cord. Even her MRI scans were normal, and that's the problem. Tethered cord can cause a constellation of symptoms, so that's how it's currently diagnosed. Relentless pain, for one. Numbness, weakness in the legs is also part of the neurological problem. Then the second most important symptom is bladder and bowel dysfunction. And the last part are orthopedic symptoms, um, particularly younger patients affected with cellar cord develop scoliosis or abnormal curvature of the spine. Based on all of the symptoms, Dr. Petra Klinger, a national expert on tethered cord, knew exactly what it was. For oh, lucky, the, 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 the main concern was that the symptoms progressed. So Dr. Klinger performed delicate surgery on her spine. The goal of the surgery is to free up the spinal cord. And this surgery really has been a saving grace for her. It has improved her quality of life immensely. Lucky saw improvement in her migraines, her strength, and her stamina. Uh, push against my hand. Okay. Well, I'm definitely growing more muscles in my legs. I saw that. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. But like we do, we do band practice after school, and before the surgery, I would just be so tired. Not anymore. Lucky is truly lucky. Dr. Klinga says she's performed more than 150 tethered cord surgeries at Hasbro, with 80% of patients improving significantly. Now she's working to improve the diagnostic tools and making doctors more aware of this disorder so it can be found and treated early. For more on Tethered Court, including an upcoming symposium, go to tethered10.com and click on Help. And that's Health Check. Barbara Moore Silva, NBC 10 News. I also wanted to share that with you because it pretty much says everything what I want to say with my talk. <laughs> but um, I want to do a little bit of basics here. Um, so, you know, um, why do we even have Tethered Court? Well, um, when looking more into it, it's not so surprising that probably more people have tethered cord than we think. Because what basically tethered cord is, it's embryonic spinal cord um, that uh, in the early weeks of our gestation um, goes backwards. So when we are embryos, we are pretty much when the caudal neuropore builds, which is the extension of the spinal cord, uh, we all having a little tail. And then that tail later on got, goes backwards. And I always say that we have a little tail still inside our spinal canal, but this process that, that in embryological terms, it's called retrogressive differentiation. If that goes wrong, um, then our tail can be abnormal and um, uh, that 
little tail, what we call the phylum terminale, can pull or you know affect our tethered, our spinal cord by stretch or um, other nasty things that this can appendix can do to our spinal cord. So um, uh, that said, you can assume that it's probably more likely that this very delicate process. Uh, can go wrong and probably more people have an abnormally structured phylum than they think, whether that ultimately and, uh, you know, translates into having symptoms of the cord, that's another thing. But I just want to mention that this process uh, might be a very insidious process and uh, a very likely process to happen, probably, even. So um, uh, the phylum that is usually a collaterous band here uh, is totally abnormally structured uh, when you look at it in situations of tethered cord. And uh, Dr. Stoper in the afternoon will talk a little bit about our histological findings in the uh, occult uh, tethered cord scenario. So, um, well, uh, a little bit of a wide tethered cord. Um, also, the question is, well, okay, what happens when you become symptomatic? And um, people certainly think about tether cord, um, of tether cord that is a stretch to the spinal cord because of the abnormal um, uh, elasticity of the phylum coronale <coughs> that connects the spinal cord to the tailbone. But um, Dr. Yamada, uh, uh, has done great work. He passed away last year, sadly so. Um, he looked more at the metabolic uh, consequences of that mechanical or whatever abnormal uh, uh, plasticity it is that happens with a uh, tight phylum um, and found out that uh, the stretch probably most likely causes oxidative stretch in, to the neurons. Uh, they found um, uh, changes in electrophysiological activity that indicates a sh shift in the uh, reduction oxidation ratio, which basically means, in very simple words, there is ischemia to the spinal cord. The spinal cord literally strokes out, certainly in a very insidious way, and that certainly makes you understand that people with cell cord do face irreversible syndromes if it is taken care of too late. And uh, so that's why we understand that we have to keep a good eye on a person that displays symptoms if it's at least <coughs> just a very thorough monitoring. So um, how we define the tethered cord symptomatology is based on a syndrome. So um, people usually display like um, three main elements in their uh, symptomatology. The one is um, like pains uh, in the back and the legs, often aches, fatigue, soreness, not so much like radiculopathy. Radiculopathy means like that the pain indicates that one nerve root is affected. So usually the pain doesn't go from the hip to the uh, toe. It's more like a inside or like uh, not quite localized. <coughs> Certainly you find neurological findings. I won't go through them in detail. Um, the second and probably the most important, and Dr. Santos, uh, my colleague working in neurology, um, uh, without her I wouldn't exist, uh, she will talk about the urgency, the frequency, and the geodynamic findings that are, is probably a very important biomarker in this uh, realm. And then orthopedic findings uh, that uh, not only show scoliosis and abnormal curvature of the spine, as I mentioned, but also delay in growth uh, in younger children, uh, joint subluxations uh, uh, that we probably uh, might see in EDS as a sign even of a, a abnormal stretch of the spinal cord. Um, the occult tether cord is what we what has a high prevalence in, uh, in EDS and probably other connective tissue disorders, where there is nothing on the MRI. Um, the MRI classically shows the stretch of the cord by an abnormal level of the spine, and Dr. Baker will talk about it. Um, and, the, uh, and in occult tethered cord, um, uh, that is defined where the MRI is negative um, and uh, 
two decades ago, pediatric neurosurgeons were the first that pioneered the occult tethered cord, where they did surgeries for tethered cord in children displaying neurodynamic uh, abnormalities without any further explanation and leg pains with successful results. So we are studying here the occult tethered syndrome, certainly also in a large population of adults, and we are looking at the criteria uh, that really um, uh, are most diagnostic uh, for the triad of the tether cord syndrome and also ultimately most prognostic to predict the success of the outcome um, of tethered cord intervention. And of those, uh, certainly not a surprise, there's a high prevalence of patients with Ehlers Danlos comorbidity, mostly the hypermobile type. Um, so um, uh, the results so far show, this is a busy slide, uh, but this is all the symptoms that we are uh, looking at in all, each of the categories. These are the urinary and bowel symptoms, and we look at bowel and bladder dysfunction. We are looking at the neurological symptoms that we find. We also find paresthesias, cramps, curling of the toes, falling, tripping, headaches, uh, suboccipital pressure, uh, we understand that the cord probably has very remote effects on the body, not only on the base of the spine, but also on the shoulders, on the posture, hands, and, and the head. Um, and um, also then certainly orthopedic symptoms. And we kind of found like the top three, uh, which um, also show great improvement after surgery, um, which are the neurological, it's mainly the leaking, uh, the constipation, and the retention that are on the top three. In those patient, in the patient population, uh, orthopedic is a back pain, ankle and foot deformities, the scoliosis, and the neurological symptoms are lower extremity pain, weaknesses, and very important, often asymmetric neurological findings. I have to say, the more I look at the asymmetry, the more I'm convinced that this is probably a very good biomarker for an occult a hidden tether cord. Um, I want to skip over the uh, decision making here because I wanted to talk about some genetic aspects. Um, the, um, uh, certainly, you have to qualify uh, your symptomatology and show urological, neurological, and orthopedic changes. We have the triad. If the triad is not always complete, we certainly have to rely on the eudynamic studies. So far, the most important biomarker that we have in the absence of any finding in the, in the MRI. And um, uh, comorbidities shouldn't be excluded, but um, if um, uh, there is concern, or if there is equivocal finding, certainly the progression is the last piece of evidence that we have. Often, I recommend to have close monitoring of the person and see the person every six months and to see whether somehow tethered cord syndrome declares itself. A very thorough approach. Um, two more minutes. Um, I want to mention uh, that certainly what we try to understand, let alone how tethered cord is connected to connective tissue disorders, maybe the hypermobility, but there are certainly genetic conditions where we already know that there's a high prevalence of tethered cord. For example, the Vectal syndrome. It's a, a, a syndrome associated with uh, anorectal and bladder malformations, and tethered cord has a high prevalence, and often babies with Vectal syndromes already undergo tethered cord release. Uh, and um, certainly stressors in life are also probably a source of epigenetic uh, um, uh, effects on tethered cord where you can actually acquire a problem. Um, but I had um, been contacted by uh, Annette Mo uh, uh, Mogan and Patty Welton, uh, um, who are here in the audience, that I should be looking at other genetic conditions uh, that um, uh, are associated with tethered cord. And they brought to my attention uh, something that I hadn't known yet, the KBG syndrome, which is a genet genetic defect on the uh, AN. KRD11 gene with a, a, a deletion in the 16Q. I learned all that. <laughs> I feel good about that. And there's a high prevalence 
uh, of um, tethered cord in this population as well. Not a surprise because that genetic syndrome is um, associated with many skeletal and muscul muscular issues, so why should tethered cord not be in the mix? And this is a little um, uh, 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 slide that uh, Annette gave me, uh, and uh, she uh, really wants to bring that matter, and I'm very excited to work together with Annette on um, tethered cord in other rare diseases and also with PADI. So truly, we have to say that the phylum escapes um, the imaging. And uh, sometimes I am intrigued when I um, uh, uh, perform the procedures how much abnormality the phylum shows and it hasn't been seen in the MRI. So MRI is truly not um, the biomarker. We have to find better biomarkers.